and welcome. I'm Frank Lavallo, and this is Novel Conversations. This week, I'm having a novel conversation about the novel Tortilla Flat by John Steinbeck. And I'll be joined in my conversation by our Novel Conversations readers, Ildi and Scott Rich. Ildi, Scott, welcome. Thank Pleasure you. to be back. Ildi, Scott, as you know, before we start our novel conversation each week, I usually like to read a little summary of the book to get us started on our novel. But I've got to tell you, in this week's novel, John Steinbeck gives us a great summary in his preface. So I'm just going to read John Steinbeck's summary of his own novel. This is the story of Danny and of Danny's friends and of Danny's house. It is a story of how these three become one thing, so that in Tortilla Flat, if you speak of Danny's house, you do not mean a structure of wood flaked with old whitewash, overgrown with an ancient untrimmed rose of Castile. No, when you speak of Danny's house, you are understood to mean a unit of which the parts are men, from which came sweetness and joy, philanthropy, and in the end, a mystic sorrow. For Danny's house was not unlike the round table, and Danny's friends were not unlike the knights of it. And this is the story of how that group came into being, of how it flourished, and how it grew to be an organization beautiful and wise. This story deals with the adventuring of Danny's friends, with the good they did, with their thoughts and their endeavors. And in the end, this story tells how the talisman was lost and how the group disintegrated. Scott, that's a pretty good summary for our story, isn't it? Oh, that's precisely it. It's almost more of the knights errant with bizarre moralizing about their endeavors, which are less than knightly. Scott, I have to be honest with you, though. When I read this book, I was not reminded of King Arthur's Round Table. And if Steinbeck hadn't mentioned it in his preface, I'm not sure if I ever would have gotten there. How about you? I picked up on the parody of a Knights of the Round Table theme at least a third of the way through the book. Ildi, was it there for you? Absolutely not. And until you mentioned it, I can honestly say I pretty much forgot that he mentioned it in the preface. I gotta tell you, I have a hard time finding this organization beautiful and wise, like he says. To me, this story is just a bunch of guys sitting around drinking a whole lot of wine. And to you, that had no sweetness or joy, no beauty? Well, at times it had beauty in its own strange, twisted kind of moralistic world. (laughs) Scott, how about you? Was this a beautiful and wise organization? Beautifully entertaining, horrifically wise, absolutely, like I said, a laugh out loud sort of book. It certainly is good for that. All right, well, I think with that introduction, what we'll do is we'll find out if this organization was beautiful and wise by meeting Danny and his friends, and we'll get started on our novel. We actually meet Danny and his friends before the novel begins, again, in John Steinbeck's preface. We meet Danny with his friends Pilon and Big Joe Portigi when World War I is declared against Germany. They are inspired by patriotic fervor. They go get a gallon of wine, they drink said gallon of wine, and then they go and enlist. Now, really, though, were they inspired by their patriotic fervor or were they inspired by that gallon of wine? Well, the fervor inspired them to have a few toasts to their country and fellow man. And then that one toast after another led them to enlist. And do they actually serve? Not in battle. Danny is hardly sober and is being interviewed by the army recruiter and is asked, what did you do before? Me? I'm a mule skinner. Oh, you are. How many mules can you drive? Danny leaned forward vaguely and professionally. How many you got? About 30,000, said the sergeant. String them up, he said. So Danny went to Texas and broke mules for the duration of the war. Pilon marched about Oregon with the infantry, and Big Joe, as shall be later made clear, went to jail. Ildi, the preface ends with them going off to war, and chapter one begins with them coming home from war. Well, Danny is back now in Monterey. The first thing he learns is that his grandfather has died and has left him two small houses in a small suburb called Tortilla Flat. As soon as Danny learns about this, he's weighed down heavily with the responsibility of ownership. And how does he solve that weighty responsibility? He takes a dollar and buys a gallon of wine and drinks most of it himself. (laughs) At which point he busts out a few windows, makes obscene gestures at the Italian fishermen. And gets himself locked up. He spent a month in jail. It didn't seem to bother him too much. He seems rather used to sitting around in jail. So he befriends the bedbugs. <laughs> it says here, The bedbugs bothered him a little at first, but as they got used to the taste of him and he grew accustomed to their bites, they got along peacefully. And then he started playing a satiric game. He'd catch a bedbug, squash it against the wall, 
draw a circle around it with a pencil and name them various officials like Mayor Clough, etc. And some of the others he named after other members of the city council. Yes, of course, but not the justice of the peace who had sentenced him or any of the police force because he had a vast respect for the law. And it's this respect for the law that actually helps him get out of this jail, doesn't it? I suppose. <laughs> well, he becomes good friends with the jailer. Who's the jailer? Tito Ralph. They take up drinking together at the jail. Eventually, they decide, why sit around drinking in the jail? Let's go sit around and drink in the bar, which they do. And Danny forgets to go back to the jail afterwards. And they don't ever come after him, do they? Well, they talk <laughs> about it a little. They just kind of pass him off as escaped. <laughs> And it's at this point that he catches up with his good friend, Pilon. Pilon is also one of the ones that had gone into the army with Danny and has now also been discharged. Right. And how do they meet up? Danny suddenly sees Pilon clutching his coat lovingly across his bosom. Turns out he's got alcohol. A full bottle of brandy. Well, Danny's also got something under his coat, doesn't he? An assortment of foods. That he has stolen. So now we have two friends, a bottle of brandy, and some food. I think this is going to end pretty well. <laughs> a match made in tortilla flat. How does this work out? Well, they drink the brandy, they eat the food, they get cold and think, if only we had a home. And then Danny remembers, I do have a home. Two of them. <laughs> do they finally get to these houses? Eventually they do. Pilon kind of guilts Danny into letting him stay with him. And then at the end of chapter one, Danny says, Pilon, I swear, what I have is thine. While I have a house, thou hast a house. And this will carry out throughout the book. Scott, there's a fun description of this house as they're standing in front of it. A low house streaked with old whitewash, uncurtained windows, blank and blind, but a great pink rose of Castile was on the porch, and grandfather geraniums grew among the weeds in the front yard. It has three rooms, a bed, and a stove. An airtight stove. And a sink with a faucet. And no running water. <laughs> or electricity. Well, Scott, soon they change their mind, though. This plan of them both living in this house, that's not what they're going to do. No, Pilone hates waste. And so Danny should rent out the other house to Pilone. And they agree on $15 a month. $15 a month? They can't even <laughs> get $3 together to either turn on the water or buy a, a gallon of wine. Nope. As Steinbeck writes, Pilone, except for this year in the army, had never possessed $15 in his life. But he thought it would be a month before the rent was due. And who could tell what might happen in a month? Eternally optimistic. And this arrangement works out well for both of them at the moment. For a while, with Pilone living in Danny's other house and never really paying him rent. And Danny never asking him for rent because he's his friend. And actually, as the novel continues, the fact that Pilone is not paying Danny any rent begins to weigh on him a little bit. He feels guilty about that. Yes, he does. So how's he going to resolve that problem? Well, he wants to go and find money, but every time he comes across any of it, he spends it on wine. I think, well, Danny would like this better than money anyways. So back to the wine. <laughs> Every time any of them have one dollar to spare, they go buy a gallon of wine. That's right. And it seems, though, every time they bring out a bottle of wine, another friend emerges. Now we meet their friend Pablo. And Pablo comes home with Pilon, and they're going to share this house. Now, wait a minute. Pilon is going to sublet the house that he's renting for $15 a month to Pablo? Yeah, because then if Pablo gives him money, he can give the money to Danny. But does Pablo ever give him any money? None of them have any money, and they don't like working, so they're not going to get any money. Yeah, but this works out well for Pilon, right? Because now whenever Danny asks him for the rent, he can say, as soon as Pablo gives me my rent, I'll have your rent. Always someone to blame. And in the meantime, they find more wine. <laughs> and there's a great account here about wine. Two gallons is a great deal of wine, even for two paisanos. Just below the shoulder of the first bottle, serious and concentrated conversation. Two inches farther down, sweetly sad memory. Three inches more, thoughts of old and satisfactory loves. An inch, thoughts of bitter loves. Bottom of the first jug, general and undirected sadness. Shoulder of the second jug, black, unholy despondency. Two fingers down, a song of death or longing. A thumb, every other song each one knows. The graduation stop here, for the trail splits and there is no certainty. From this point on, anything can happen. <laughs> and that goes on throughout the novel. They kind of refer to this gradation of drunkenness. You know, you start off happy, and then you turn to sadness, then you talk about women, and then you start the singing. And after that, usually it deteriorates into fighting. 
And sure enough, after this bottle of wine comes out, so does another friend. Jesus Maria Corcoran. Scott, what do we know about Jesus Maria? He is found lying passed out in the woods, essentially. And he's a longtime friend. And they say, come home with us. And they again sublet the house <laughs> with a down payment this time, which they're going to give to Danny because he does want to buy a gift for a young lady in Tortilla Flat. Right, unlike Pallone or Pablo, Jesus Maria actually has some cash on him. At least for the day. <laughs> but on the way to Tortilla Flat with the money, they decide, you know, Danny would be better off if we just bought wine with this money instead. And give it to the woman instead of candy. Because, of course, as everyone knows, candy will ruin her teeth and he wouldn't want that. It's always so altruistic of them, all their decisions. Now, who did Danny want the candy for? Mrs. Morales, the next door neighbor. <laughs> Has he been successful in this wooing? Yes, and it's a very good deal at this point because she's very rich. She has hundreds of dollars in the bank, and she has chickens, which they've often stolen. So she owns one house and chickens. Danny owns two houses. And has no money in the bank. <laughs> and three renters in one of his houses. That never pay any rent. Oh, boy. But they do bring wine from time to time, which is what he really <laughs> needs anyways. But he's not the owner of two houses for long. They bring home a blessed candle. And sure enough, this blessed candle is a bastard. <laughs> Indeed, it was a saint's candle, St. Francis at that. And the flames jump up too high, spark the pine wood of the house, and the whole thing is engulfed in flames before long. The wine in the bottle went too low, they fell asleep, and the candle went too high. And there goes Danny's second little house. And as they stood outside the burning house and looked in the open fire curtain door, they could see the jug of wine standing on the table with a good two inches of wine left in it. And Jesus Maria almost goes in to save those last two inches of wine. And Pallone saves him and says, don't do it. It must be lost in the fire as a punishment on us for leaving it. So they need to be punished for leaving the wine in a house that they just burned down. <laughs> exactly. Right. This is the lesson that they're learning. Where's Danny when his house is burning down? At Mrs. Morales' house. And they go and try to tell Danny. They're a little nervous about going up there to tell him, but they figure he'd want to know that his second house is burned down. And so they yell outside of Mrs. Morales' house. Well, Scott, actually, Danny has two reactions to finding out that his house is on fire. His first reaction, he doesn't want to be disturbed and he can't do anything about it anyways. His second reaction is the next morning. And he feels, as Steinbeck writes, Relief that at least one of his burdens was removed. For having two houses was a tremendous burden. <laughs> <laughs> now, where does this leave Pablo, Pilon, and Jesus Maria? They're out in the cold, or at least out in the warm. Well, of course, then Danny's going to bring them into his house. And now they're all going to live there happily ever after, so we think. They go on to blame the fire on God himself and say, who are we if God wants it to be gone? Well, they make Danny some promises, don't they, in order to atone for burning down his house? Yes. Steinbeck writes, Then Jesus Maria, in a frenzy of gratefulness, made a rash promise. It shall be our burden and our duty to see that there is always food in the house of Danny. He declaimed, Never shall our friend go hungry. Uh-oh. Pallon and Pablo. They look up at him and say, Huh? What did you get us into? <laughs> Where are we going to get food every day? It's one thing to promise him $15 that everybody knows we don't have. Now you're promising food and wine. He might actually expect us to provide that. This almost seems reasonable. <laughs> Pallone even is musing to himself and says, if this promise were enforced, it would be worse than rent. It would be slavery. <laughs> and yet they do agree that this is what they're going to do to help out their friend Danny. It's the least they could do. They are very loyal to Danny. He's the leader of the pack. In fact, John Steinbeck writes, Pablo wiped his wet eyes with the back of his hand and he echoed Pallone's remark. We shall be very happy living here. <laughs> well, Scott and Ildi, we've reached a point where we've got one less house, but we now have one more friend to introduce, one more person that's going to come to live in Danny's house, the pirate. Well, let me just read you a paragraph describing the pirate, and you will find him immediately endearing, at least I did. He was a huge, broad man with a tremendous black and bushy beard. He wore jeans and a blue shirt, and he had no hat. In town, he wore shoes. There was a shrinking in the pirate's eyes when he confronted any grown man, the secret look of an animal that would like to run away if it dared turn its back long enough. Because of this expression, the paisanos of Monterey knew that his head had not grown up with the rest of his body. They called him the pirate because of his beard. 
Every day, people saw him wheeling his barrow of pitchwood about the streets until he sold the load, and always in a cluster at his heels walked his five dogs. The pirate is really the only character in this novel, other than the bootlegger Torelli, that actually has a job and does something every day. Every day, he chops down wood, takes it in his barrow, and sells it. He gets a quarter every day. Every day. He also has access to some food. He does because of his five dogs and his homeless status. And people pity him for being mentally inept. Yes. He goes and begs at the back door of many of the different houses. And they give him scraps of bread and meat and whatever they are going to throw out. Some of these places think they're actually giving him scraps of food for his dogs. And certainly he shares this stuff with his dogs. The majority of it. But it also feeds him every day. Right. Now here's a guy in Tortilla Flat that has money and food. Certainly it's not going to be very long before Pilone, Pablo, and Danny latch on to this guy. And Pilone is the schemer of the group. He comes up with the idea, well, if he gets 25 cents for every load, and he's been doing this for years, and he never spends any money... Where is this treasure that he's hiding? He must have thousands of quarters scrolled away somewhere. He gave up on doing the math. It became too complicated. But he knows he wants a piece of it. Well, Ildi, don't leave me in suspense. Do these knights errant of Danny's get this money? Well, one of Pallone's schemes is to convince the pirate that he has many friends and that all of the pirate's friends are worried about him. And maybe he should come live with his friends. Pallone thinks if he's living with us, then we'll have a better chance of following him and seeing where he's burying his treasure. But Scott, not only does the pirate move into Danny's house, he turns this entire scheme around on Pallone. He ends up loving his friends, and he's so happy to have them for friends. And they share wine with him, and he's about as happy as he has ever been in his life. And he wants to do something to show them how much he loves and appreciates his friends. And so he brings his money to the house and reveals it to them on his own free will. And then we find out what the money is for. Once, the pirate had a dog, and that dog was sick. The pirate promised St. Francis of Assisi, the patron saint of animals, a gold candlestick, if that dog got well. And the dog got well. So he is saving up his money till he gets $250 so that he can pay for a golden candlestick. But wait, Ildi, you skipped over the best part of that little story. When Pallone says, is it one of these dogs that you saved? And he's got five dogs, but the pirate says, no, a truck ran him over a little while later. (laughs) (laughs) But he's still going to keep his promise to St. Francis of Assisi. Which is what makes the pirate so precious. And Scott, it's these revelations that now will prevent Danny and his friends from ever taking this money. Right. It was destined for a saint. This would just be wrong. They have some morals. (laughs) Well, Scott, once they get this settled with the pirate, we actually meet the last of Danny's errant knights come back from the war, Big Joe Portigee. Big Joe Portigee is back from the army jail for never showing up to anything and going AWOL a couple of times. And essentially, he spent the entire war in jail. And had the war not ended, he would have been shot. But since it was over, just let him go. Yeah, he didn't really understand the army. Before he went in the army, he knew that if you did certain things, you would end up in trouble and end up in jail. Well, in the army, you got in trouble for not doing certain things. If you didn't clean your rifle, if you didn't shave, or, you know, maybe once or twice when you were on leave, you didn't come back, they would put you in jail for that as well. So he spent even more than half his army life in jail. Correct. Well, Ildi, how does Big Joe Portigee end up in the house with, let me see if I can remember them all, Danny, Pilone, Pablo, Jesus Marie, the pirate, and five dogs? Well, Pilone brings Big Joe Portigee back to Danny's house, and he basically says, here's Big Joe Portigee back from the army, and everyone says, hello, Joe. And Big Joe says, you've got a nice place here, Danny, and he sits himself down easily into a chair, and Danny says, you keep out of my bed. And that's pretty much Danny's only stipulation for living in his house. Well, Scott, we're halfway through our book. We've met all of Danny's male friends. Finally, we meet a female, Dolores and Gracia Ramirez. Known as Sweets Ramirez. Tell me a little bit about Sweets Ramirez and her attraction for Danny. Well, Danny is an heir. Therefore, he's in a higher social status from most people in Tortilla Flat, especially the people who live with him. He's a homeowner. That's right. And so she wants to attract his attention, but it would be beneath her to go and leave her home to flirt with him. So she keeps standing around the yard at the gate, hoping that he'll walk by so that she can spring her trap on him. 
But let me read the way John Steinbeck writes it. When Sweets heard that Danny was an heir, she was glad for him. She dreamed of being his lady, as did every other female in Tortilla Flat. In the evening, she leaned over the front gate, waiting for the time he would pass by and fall into her trap. But for a long time, her baited trap caught nothing but poor Indians and paisanos who owned no houses and whose clothes were sometimes fugitive from better wardrobes. But eventually, Danny walks by her house and, as Steinbeck writes, Danny assaulted her virtue with true gallantry and vigor. He found to his amazement a resistance out of all proportion to her size and reputation. (laughs) And she actually kicks him out. Indeed, but tells him to come back later tonight. Because, you know, the neighbors are watching. You have to keep up your reputation. Hey Hey there. there! I'm Hannah. And I'm Audrey. We are a sister filmmaking duo and co-hosts of Sleepover Sleepover Cinema, Cinema. our show where we analyze the films that created the collective unconscious of the girls, gays, and theys of the late 90s and early 2000s. Princess Diaries, The Cheetah Girls, Aquamarine, Cinderella, the one starring Brandy. We haven't stopped thinking about these movies since we first saw them, and we want you to rewatch them and review them with us. Are these movies as bad as critics would have us believe? Do we even care if they are? We are always unpacking that very question on Sleepover Cinema. Check out Sleepover Cinema wherever you get your podcasts or at evergreenpodcasts.com. See you soon. Well, now Danny's got a little time to kill. I'm trying to think what he might do to kill this time. Oh, I know. He'll go drink wine. And buy a present to bring back that night. Oh, yeah. A $3 vacuum cleaner. No, no, no. A $2 vacuum cleaner. Oh, right. You have to save a dollar for wine, of course. Wait a minute. They don't have any electricity and he's buying her a vacuum cleaner? Of course. It's more of a status gift than it is a practical gift, I suppose. How does John Steinbeck turn a non-working vacuum cleaner into a status symbol? Oh, well, Sweets Ramirez thinks this is the greatest thing in the world. Hey, an electric cleaning machine. I have one of these and no one else has one of these. So, She will sweep her whole house with her broom, and then she will run over her house with the vacuum cleaner. Making a vacuum cleaner noise. (laughs) (laughs) And she'll insert it in every conversation. Oh, when I was cleaning with my vacuum cleaner. (laughs) But this attention from Sweets and her new status with the vacuum makes all of Danny's friends rather jealous. Why is that? I think they're afraid that he might eventually marry her and kick the rest of them out of their house. So they become a little afraid and want to break them up. And Scott, Pallone has a great idea how to do this breaking up. Well, they convince Danny that Sweets Ramirez is going to expect him to put electricity into the house so that she can use the vacuum cleaner. And this makes Danny rather furious. And so he's looking for a way out. And they conclude Pallone needs to go and steal the vacuum cleaner. (laughs) (laughs) Does he steal that vacuum cleaner? They certainly do, and they try to sell it to Torelli. Well, no, wait a minute. They don't try to sell it to Torelli. They do sell it to Torelli. For wine. For wine. Two gallons of it. (laughs) How does that work out for Torelli? Not so good. It turns out the vacuum cleaner never had a motor in it. (laughs) (laughs) And now Torelli's out another couple of gallons of wine. (laughs) It's the least of it. And when Danny's crew hears that Torelli is angry about the sweeping machine not having a motor, Pilone says, that machine was worth three or four gallons of wine. But that miser Torelli would give no more than two. And so the gentlemen decide to take revenge on Torelli. And Danny says, I think that we will buy our wine someplace else. <laughs> <laughs> of course, Torelli is actually the only place in town they can get their wine. So this is another idle threat. Right. I want to get back to the story of the pirate and his quest for the St. Francis candlestick. But there's a bit of a hiccup on their way to the candlestick. That's right. The guys have developed a kind of ritual that every day when they come back home, they put the pirate's quarter in the bull Durham bag. Now, this is the quarter he earns from cutting and selling firewood every day. Right. And so one day they come home and Danny reaches under the pillow and his hand came out empty. The bag of money is missing? The bag of money is missing. And they're all there except one. Big Joe Portigy. So immediately the suspicion falls on him. Oh, no, it's not just suspicion. They all know it was Big Joe Portigy. <laughs> they all know it once. So immediately, Danny walks out into the yard and gets a heavy pine stick three feet long. Pablo goes into the kitchen and gets an ancient can opener with a vicious blade. Jesus Maria goes and gets a broken pick handle. And the pirate is kind of confused. And it dawns on him, oh, Big Joe? And they all go, mm-hmm. So, the pirate goes into the yard and digs up his axe. (laughs) And then they wait. And they wait. Silently. 
They heard his footsteps on the street and their hands tightened on their sticks. Joe Portigy walked uncertainly up to the porch. He had a gallon of wine in his hand. His eyes went uneasily from face to face, but the friend sat still and did not look directly at him. Hello, said Big Joe. Hello, said Danny. He stood up and stretched lazily. He did not look at Big Joe. He did not walk directly toward him, but at an angle, as though to pass him. When he was abreast, he struck with the speed of a striking snake, and Big Joe went down completely out. I gotta tell you, this was an amazing scene. It happened so quickly and so brutally. There was no word spoken. No, and they beat him so severely, and then they rubbed salt in the wound. Literally. (laughs) Can you imagine what they would have done to this guy if he wasn't their friend? I don't want to think about it. He does eventually tell them that he did take the money and where it is. Right. After Big Joe went down, they finished working over the front of his body. His back is still safe. He confesses he took it. It's buried out by the gate. And I only took one dollar and I'll work real hard and I'll pay you back. And they retrieved the money to make sure that that was accurate. And then they rolled him over and finished his backside. Well, Ildi, now that they're done with Big Joe, they turn back to the money. They decide they really should count it. And they get really excited. Pirate Danny cries, there are seven over 1,000. And that's how much they needed to buy the candlestick. A thousand quarters. A thousand quarters, which is $250. And so they have seven extra. And so they tell the pirate that he needs to buy some good clothes. They don't think he should go and buy wine? Shockingly enough, no. They're rather proud of their accomplishment having not taken this money. They realize also that if they were to take the money down to buy the candlestick, they'd be accused of having stolen it for, that's their reputation. So they said, no, take the money to the priest, and the priest will buy the candlestick. But you need to have new clothes before you go to the priest. And actually, the story of the pirate getting his candlestick in honor of St. Francis of Assisi ends very well. It's beautiful. The priest is completely understanding, buys the candlestick, puts it on display, Well, Scott, now this was a good day for Danny and his crowd. And I know that you and I could probably sit on a porch, drink wine, get up with the sun, go to sleep with the moon for, I don't know, 15 or 20 years before it got to us. At the very least. But it doesn't take quite that long for Danny. Eventually, this life catches up to him. He just can't handle the monotony and the responsibility of being a homeowner. And how does this manifest itself? He starts to brood and get melancholy and downcast. And finally, one day... He just walks out, and it's a week before his friends really start to worry. At first, they just thought, hmm, he found some girl somewhere. But after a week, enough is enough, and they go to hunt him down. And turns out he's stealing things here, there, everywhere. He's even stealing from his own house. He even tries to steal the airtight stove out of the middle of the house. But he can't carry it. So he drops it down the ditch. But eventually, there comes a time where he steals the whole house. He sells the house to Torelli for $25. He has Danny sign a bill of sale, basically delivering the house to Torelli. And Torelli can't wait to tell the other guys in the house this story. That's right. He's tired of trading wine for used merchandise and having that used merchandise stolen the same day. Not only that, but all the attention that these men pay to his wife doesn't sit very well with him either. Correct. So now he's got them where he wants them, out on the street. He shows up at the door, bill of sale in hand. I'm sorry, you must leave. If you're not gone by noon, I will call the sheriff. But quick-thinking Pallone comes up with a scheme. <laughs> Steinbeck says, oh, beware, Torelli, when Pallone moves smiling on you. <laughs> and so, basically, Pallone figures out that this piece of paper is the only thing that he has to prove the ownership has passed to Torelli and that it has not been officially recorded. So, they beat the tar out of Torelli take the paper, and burn it. Steinbeck writes it this way. He heard the stove lid clang. Thieves, he screamed. Thieves, oh rats and dogs, give me back my paper. Pallone stands in front of him and says, what paper? Big Joe Portigy says, I didn't see any paper. Pablo says, paper? You mean like a newspaper? (laughs) Jesus Maria says, I think he's drunk. It's too early in the morning for him to be drunk. (laughs) Joe Portigy? Joe says, I wasn't here. I just came in now. The pirate? He don't have no paper. The pirate turned to his dogs. Does he? (laughs) Even the dogs don't think that Torelli is the owner anymore. (laughs) That's right. And then Torelli's too stunned to shout anymore. They turn him about, help him out the door, and speed him on his way, sunk in the awfulness of his defeat. And then it occurs to them, wait a minute. If Danny sold a house to Torelli for $25, Danny's got money. And wine. We better go find Danny. (laughs) And Danny shows up. Does he show up with wine? Two bags full of wine and food. A feast for his friends. 
At this point, they do have some slight remorse to what has happened to Torelli, and they state, we will get all our wine from Torelli to make it up to him. And this is not idle. (laughs) Again, as we said before, this is the only wine merchant in town. Well, Scott, Danny's back, but he hasn't really been completely cured of this melancholy he's been feeling. No, it's insatiable. He's completely downtrodden, doesn't hardly talk, even lets flies crawl on his feet without trying to swat them away. But Ildi, his friends do come up with a plan to cheer him up. Yeah, they say what Danny needs is a lot of wine. Let's have a party. Let's have a huge party. How are they going to pull off this huge party? Well, they don't like the sounds of it, but they finally convince themselves we've got to work. Where are they going to get jobs? Apparently there's jobs to be had any day of the week if you want it. So they decided to go and cut squid all day long. They say one day would not be so bad. So all his friends, these knights errant that we've been calling them, go on down to the shore and cut squid for a day. And they earn... Fourteen dollars. Fourteen dollars. This actually draws so much attention. Everyone from Tortilla Flat and all the children go and stare in amazement at what is happening before their very own eyes. Danny's friends are all working. And they realize something special is happening. And then the rumor spreads. They're having a party at Danny's house. And the entire town of Tortilla Flat is excited and wants to go to Danny's party. Steinbeck writes, doing this work lit a spark and Tortilla Flat was tender. And the whole place was soon ablaze with all the activity. This fire even catches Torelli. Mm -hmm. These guys have just cheated him out of the house he thought he bought from Danny. And yet he says at the end, well, I think I'll bring a few gallons up to Danny's party. Those are my friends. (laughs) So how is the party? Great. And the number one activity of all these parties, and this one is no exception, is a good fight. Who fights? Everyone. Remember. That's the final gradation of drunkenness. (laughs) Well, it's the second last gradation. But at the end, anything could happen. And in fact, what happens, Scott? Well, Danny gets to a point where he is so consumed with the joy of fighting that he has a table leg in one hand and is challenging everyone. And at this point, everyone has had their fill and is no longer ready to fight. And Danny goes zooming off into the night to find a worthy opponent. And Ildi, what happens to Danny? Well, Danny doesn't find many people who are willing to take him on, so he runs out into the gulch. They heard his last shrill cry of defiance, and then a thump. Scott, what happened to Danny? He's just fallen down a 40-foot cliff. Did he fall or did he jump? We don't know. But regardless, he's dead, and now there needs to be a funeral. And fortunately, he was in the military, so there is someone to pick up the tab for the funeral. But his friends, they have a problem. Unfortunately, they don't have clothes that are decent enough for a proper funeral. And as Pallone says, the funeral's in two days. We don't have time to steal eight suits. But they do manage to see him off with wine. Following the funeral, they're enjoying a few rounds. Somebody else shows up, passes out cigars, tosses the match. They see the flame flicker, and all of a sudden, an idea occurs to Pallone. And all of them together, all at once, realize, let the flames climb high. Just like the first house. Right. However, they have learned a lesson from that first burning. This time, Pallone grabs the wine. And here's how the novel ends, the last sentence. After a while, they turned and walked slowly away, and no two walked together. And that's how the band of Danny disintegrated. And that is how our novel, Tortilla Flat, ends. But now, Scott, Ildi, what I'd like from you now is perhaps a quote or a character that we haven't had a chance to talk about. This is not a large book, but there's so many adventures in here. Perhaps you have one you want to give us, Scott? Well, Pilone may be my favorite character because of his very original moralizing. Pilone says about the gift that Danny had given to Sweets Ramirez, By this we learn that a present, especially to a lady, should have no quality that will require a further present. Also we learn that it is sinful to give presents of too great value, for they may excite greed. (laughs) Ildi? Well, everyone knows that my favorite character was the pirate. But since we covered the pirate pretty fully, I'm going to mention a character who we did not touch upon at all. Senora Teresina Cortez. She had eight children and she lived with her ancient mother. And so there's a comical explanation of how they procure food. Steinbeck writes, when the bean threshers have passed, you will see where they have stopped big piles of bean chaff. If you will spread a blanket on the ground and on a windy afternoon toss the shaft into the air over the blanket, you will understand that the threshers are not infallible. For an afternoon of work, you may collect 20 or more pounds of beans. (laughs) And that's all she fed her kids. Beans and tortillas. That's it. 
She even says fruit and green things are not good for children. That's right. <laughs> That's right. And I think one of the kids says for breakfast, we have tortillas and beans. For lunch, we have tortillas and beans. For dinner, it's beans and tortillas. <laughs> she even says milk is bad for babies after they're weaned. <laughs> <laughs> One of the characters we didn't really get a chance to talk about that I enjoyed was Tito Ralph. He's the jailer. Well, Tito Ralph became the jailer because when he was younger, he spent so much time in the jail himself that he learned how to run it perfectly. So finally, they made him the jailer. I think that's a great little story. So crime does pay. Well, it certainly paid for Tito Ralph. <laughs> Until he let one too many escape. That's right. He did get fired at the end because he let one guy too many out of the jail to go buy wine. Yeah, Danny. <laughs> That's right, Ildi. And with that fond memory of Danny being free, I think we'll end our conversation today about the novel Tortilla Flat by John Steinbeck. Thanks both of you for coming in. It's been a great pleasure. Absolutely. Joining me now for end notes on today's conversation is our researcher, Ted Schwartz. Ted, how you doing? Great. How are you? I'm very good. Ted, I've got to tell you, for readers who hadn't been exposed to much John Steinbeck, we all really enjoyed and had a lot of fun with this novel. But I understand John Steinbeck didn't really share that enjoyment about this novel. That's correct. Steinbeck was a relatively young writer, making about $35 a week, which was decent money back then, but no big successes until Tortilla Flat sold to the movies. Trouble was, Steinbeck went out during the day taking walks, not really researching, observing. During the day, the people he saw were people who weren't working. So he was trying to write what he knew or what he could observe. What he could observe without doing much work. He saw what amounted to bums. They did not represent the majority of the immigrant population, the majority of the migrant population, the majority of laborers from Mexico. Decided to use them as characters. They were actually caricatures. And it was a very funny novel, but it was very vicious and very naive, which he realized and was very embarrassed afterwards. Essentially, he took a few characters, a few people he met, and extrapolated that into an entire community or the entire village of Tortilla Flat. Yes, instead of going out at night, going to the businesses, really getting to know the community, which after Tortilla Flat, he started to do. And everything that he learned began to color his later work and his later writing. So this change in attitude really did inform his later novels. Yes, completely. He had tremendous sensitivity for the individuals and their struggles to survive, to triumph, in some cases to have their children triumph. So, Ted, it was actually selling the movie rights to Tortilla Flat that made Steinbeck his money, not selling Tortilla Flat the book. That's correct. He made several thousand dollars selling the rights for a screenplay. There would be more money coming several years later when they actually made it in Hollywood. And, of course, the publicity for that helped sell the book. But, Ted, this financial success didn't really go to his head. He put it to good use. Yes, he started an organization and was directly involved with getting food and clothing to low-income working people who couldn't quite make ends meet. He also wrote for serious journals about the plight of these individuals to get national help. And of course, as we said, it was this change in attitude which then informs and leads to some of his later novels. Yes, and there's a much greater depth of character in the future. But I've got to bet they weren't as funny as our characters in Tortilla Flat. Not at all. All right, well, Ted, as usual, some very interesting information about John Steinbeck and his novel, Tortilla Flat. I also want to thank our Novel Conversations readers, Scott and Ildi Rich, for having this conversation with me today. You've been listening to Novel Conversations. I'm your host, Frank Lavallo. Today, I had a conversation about the novel, Tortilla Flat, by John Steinbeck. And until next week, I hope you find yourself in a novel conversation. Novel Conversations is a production of the Front Porch People. Listen to more great conversations at thefrontporchpeople.com. Thank you for listening. Hey there! I'm Hannah. And I'm Audrey. We are a sister filmmaking duo and co-hosts of Sleepover, Sleepover Cinema. Cinema, our show where we analyze the films that created the collective unconscious of the girls, gays, and theys of the late 90s and early 2000s. Princess Diaries, The Cheetah Girls, Aquamarine, Cinderella, the one starring Brandy. We haven't stopped thinking about these movies since we first saw them, and we want you to rewatch them and review them with us. Are these movies as bad as critics would have us believe? Do we even care if they are? We are always unpacking that very question on Sleepover Cinema. Check out Sleepover Cinema wherever you get your podcasts or at evergreenpodcasts.com. See you soon. This podcast was produced with the support of the Ohio Motion Picture Tax Credit and in partnership with the Ohio Development Services Agency.